Yeah. Welcome to the, the um, special purpose operating system working group. As part of the CNCF, we follow the CNCF code of conduct. Um, there is a reference in the agenda doc, which I will post in the chat, if you'd like to look at that. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> um, so with that out of the way, I'll hand it over to you, Eric. Uh, no, first, actually, first before that, first on the agenda is Eric uh, to talk about EVOS. Um, but if you have anything else you would like to discuss today, feel free to throw that on the agenda. Okay, handing it over to you. Okay, let me um, show up once more. Yes, now I should be able to share something here. Some slides, okay. So you should be able to see some slides. Hope you, everybody can hear me okay. Um, so, um, so this is uh, a, a project in LF Edge. It's been part of LF Edge for about four years or something like that. So um, I'm wearing two hats. One is that I'm the city CTO, but I'm also the, the EVE Technical Steering Committee Chair um, in LF Edge. So. And it's a pleasure to to come and talk to you about this stuff. So, um, so so we went at this sort of starting from from what's the actual problem that we're trying to solve. This started about six years ago, and we saw that yeah, people want to be able to deploy things at the edge. Uh, at the time, it wasn't even called the edge; it was called industrial IoT or something. Um, and you know, the things that might might want to deploy has changed over time but but what we saw was the biggest challenges was out at what we call the distributed edge so this is um, you know out on factory floors and you know solar farms whatever and typically single or a few servers in some on-prem location and in many cases this invo involves thousands of locations um, and and we sort of started off with a bunch of technology that ideas about secure overlay network and everybody's going to run unikernels okay because this is how you make things small for the edge like yeah that, that didn't happen right it was more like the the users that wanted to get started in many cases they were running windows on some industrial pc with some app but they saw that they need to move with the containers and they need to move the kubernetes and you know maybe they will get to using kernels at some point in time for for making things really small or you know, wasm or something right um but it's a journey, um, and in sort of figuring out what is needed and what parts of that journey. So, um, but this raised issues about several things that people hadn't seen, even though the technology is there. The issues that that we ran into was, you know, some unknown state in terms of the physical security as well as network security. Um, what's the state of reliable power? Right? Uh, what what software implications do you get out of that? Um, definitely intermittent connectivity, um, and it could be various unusual things for someone who's coming from deploying VMs or containers in a data center, you know, static IPs, man in the middle, uh, HTTPS proxies, some need for active standby to fall over to LTE connectivity, et cetera, right? Um, um, towards the internet. The other part is that this is some rich local connectivity needs. There's still places where people run Modbus over serial, even though most of it has moved over to um, Modbus over, over TCP, right over Ethernet. But but there are sort of a larger diversity of connectivity, some custom boards and you know, PCIe devices sitting out there. Um, there's no, in some cases, there's no staff on site. There's no staff within hundreds of miles. Right? Um, in other cases, there is staff that's sort of involved with the operational part of what they're doing out there, uh, but there's definitely no IT people anywhere around. So, um, and and you know, 
those cases when people, and this is something that this sort of this we're exploring more now is, well, what does it mean if you want to enforce policy globally in terms of here's the versions of your containers, your pods to go deploy, but it's sitting in an air gap network. How can I carry that policy in and, you know, somehow audit that um, and, and sure, I need to have my OCI registry inside the air gap network and audit the actual content of those containers so they're not malicious. But but how can it work in those types of air gap environments? Um, so we already have users with you know ten thousand single node Kubernetes clusters, right? So it sort of flipped things around from the typical cloud Kubernetes deployments that that the scaling is in the number of clusters, not in the number of nodes per cluster. So yeah, we we have had customers that have seen what issues they run. Um, so that's sort of setting some context. So, um, and then in particular, um, what does it mean security-wise? Um, and we sort of, this is one of my original concerns was, yeah, we have lots of great protocols, but the default way people build software is they add security afterwards, or they think about it after they deployed things. Um, and so, um, what are they, at the top level is, what is worth protecting? Is it the operating system? Well, there's no secrets in there, right? Um, so the the thing that that people in general want to protect, apart from not sort of easily disrupting operations at the site, it's either the you know intellectual property in the applications themselves or models that they deploy, as well as the data they actually collect. So in some cases, it's not necessarily personal information, but if you're analyzing an oil or gas well, well, how much? Get, how much resources is left might in some cases be national security concerns because how much how much oil and gas does a country still have is quite sensitive right? so, um, and when you look at this um, in these environments well you don't know what the environment is you, there might be a firewall there might be cases with, where things are co-deployed with a separate physical firewall appliance or a, a virtual you know um, firewall appliance or or not, right? And what's the state of physical access? There might be people on site uh, or not. You might have cameras and, you know, alarms, but it might be 100 miles from the nearest person that can go there. Uh, so we've, there's been cases when equipment's been stolen, and sure, they saw someone was there, but you sh someone shows up hours later, right? All gone. So. Um, and then... Uh, Another thing that's important is this disconnected thing that you know um, the 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 key value. So I come from an IT OS background, whatever, right? Um, it's it's not the 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 OS that's important; it's the applications. It's not the infrastructure that's important. And in particular, if after the power goes out, well, you expect everything to come up and run again, including when there's actually no uh, no internet connectivity. So so you know the internet. It's critical to enable this stuff, but you can't depend on it being there when when you expect it to. Um, so that's a key constraint. And some of the things that we've run into is that there's a set of existing approaches that doesn't, some of them work, some of them don't, right? So it's clear that if you want to do this, you want to focus on minimization and hardening. Um, and you need an, a scalable update mechanism. And clearly the things that other projects have talked about, so immutable images, it makes all of this stuff easier, right? Um, a host bay fire, firewall can help with network security, um, but you have to figure out sort of from the application perspective, well, does the application allow what form of inbound connectivity does the application have users and passwords that need to be managed? How do people do that if it needs to fit in with some corporate sort of with a single sign-on type thing, auditing, whatever, right? What can you do out at these, this this distributed edge? Uh, you probably want to have some level of security monitoring to to address this stuff. And and it's different because all of these things you basically get for free when you're running things in the cloud. Um, you can just reinstall things with your know, Pixie booting and whatever. And then last but not least, the sort of most difficult thing is, is okay, what do you do about theft? Right. How can you prevent people from reading the application, disassembling it, whatever, um, or the data that's been collected on the on the drives if the device or drive is actually stolen? Um, 
and the way people and the, the the different aspects of this, but but looking at what people run on smartphones and laptops, they don't quite fit. So secure boot, I argue, is insufficient because if you can take this device and steal it and put it in your lab, well, you only need to find some old sign BIOS, OS kernel, whatever, grub that has some known CVs that you can attack and you will actually boot with that one. And now secure boot will say, great, that's all signed, right? It's signed by the right provider. And now you can use those those um, avenues for attacking the device. Um, and full disk encryption doesn't help for protecting the data either because full disk encryption works on a laptop where you use your fingerprint scanner or, or password or whatever. Um, Likewise on a smartphone, but here there's no user sitting there. There's no dongle. If you put a dongle there to security dongle, well, the attacker's going to steal that one as well. Right? So, so sort of how can you how can you do this stuff in a way where it um, solves the problem for these unattended devices that have some physical exposure? So that was sort of the set of challenges to set up. So what we built um, at a high level is has three pieces, right? One is we have um, the Eve the Edge Virtualization Engine project um, deployed on thousands of devices. It is all managed through an API. There's a common pattern with other projects that people have talked about here. Right? Um, and then there's actually a, um, a controller that is at the other end of that API. In the ecosystem today, um, the company I work for, Sedita, they have a commercial controller. I didn't draw it on this picture because of Crib these slides off of uh, some LF Edge presentation. There's an LF Edge is actually running a free self service SaaS service um, since a couple of months back. So people can try it out, and this is to enable people to experiment with open source, et cetera. And there's also some open source controller that is, is part of the picture. Um, so you can actually see okay, this is what a, the most simplistic controller can actually look like in terms of interacting with the, with the API. So that's sort of the pieces. And, and this is not an optional component, right? There is no local way of administering the device uh, by logging into it. Um, you, can, you install it through Pixie, iPixie, USB stick, whatever, but then it, it expects to talk to a controller. Otherwise, it's a, um, a doorstop, a warm brick, whatever. Um, so feel free to ask questions as we go along as well. I won't skip this one. But. So um, inside, what do we have in, in Eve? So we have uh, a set of Eve services running on the host, right? Um, a set of microservices. This is dual partition boot. Um, so you can actually update it without any risk. And then today, everything is actually running on top of some hypervisor, on top of Zen KVM, the save and support for the Intel Acorn hypervisor. And people have deployed various things from Windows VMs. Um, what isn't shown on the picture is a single container, a set of containers all running with a micro, on top of a micro uh, um, VM, or running something like K3S uh, inside a, a VM. Um, and uh, this uses about 500 meg of RAM and one, one, one CPU core, about 500 meg of, of disk total. Um, and it is actually evolving. The right, the, the right side of this picture is actually evolving because there's more sort of flexibility needed on the runtime side of things. But I'll get to that later. And then the software stack looks like trying to depict the stuff. I actually drew these things yesterday to make this more clear. So it's actually built using Linux Kit. So the core of this stuff is you know, booting booting the kernel and then running the Linux kit con uh, in it, and it has some on-boot containers that it kicks off to make sure that the storage partitions are set up, et cetera. And then it runs Containerd. And then there's a set of even microservices as containers on top of that. And there's actually a multiple sets of these uh, microservices. So this is not a complete list, uh, but this is the set that takes care of managing the device, the OS, and the run times that run on the device. Um, so there's a watchdog service, there's a logging service. After trying for a couple of 
ones that people use in the data center, we realize that, yeah, they're good, but they, they can't deal with the power going out. They corrupt their own data and they crash. Um, sort of need to, we had to, the choice was either to build an FSEK for the, the logging format stored on disk or, or do something different. So we ended up doing something different. Um, there's separate ones for managing the, the Wi-Fi as well as managing the cellular modems and running modem, modem manager, et cetera. And there's a couple of different things that give you some level of remote access. We have a debug container that can be enabled, um, enabled and, and you can set up sort of a secure SSH key in that to get some debug access, which we use in the lab. There's something else that actually runs that stuff over a tunnel um, called Edgeview. Uh, over a tunnel from the controller so that you can actually get interactive access to the application and or to EOS subject to policies. And we have a guacamole set up that we've also used for remote console. Uh, makes it slightly easier to use from the browser. Uh, so some of that stuff will hopefully uh, consolidate over time, but not having three different flavors of things. Um, and then we have a network interface manager. Make sure that the network is configured. Uh, separate from the actual init process itself. Uh, the thing that actually manages EOS, so you can actually update it and and revert to old versions automatically if it doesn't work. And then we have some, uh, maybe the order is a bit, a bit odd here, but we have something that manages the TPM. System can work if there's no TPM chip or firmware, but, but you don't get the same security properties as well. We have a vault for storing the, the images uh, and volumes inside. So there's something to balance that. And then there's a, a download a very far and volume manager. And some people might observe, but wait, Container D already does that, right? Um, so you can actually go into the, 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 the reason for doing this stuff if need be. Um, but part of this comes from sort of defense in depth and one separation of concern in terms of who needs to talk to the network. Um, only the downloader needs to talk to the network. The thing, the, the, the thing that microservice that verifies the shots of those images, et cetera, um, doesn't need to talk to the network. So you can get better defense in depth like that in, in, in theory. So that's sort of the, the device, right? And I was like, okay, we're gonna run some VMs and, and containers and pods. And um, what do we need for that? Well, here we actually are using the same download a verifier volume manager for the applications as well as for the the um, EVOS images, which is the things on the left. And we have a, a sub manager, an orchestrator there. We have something that sets up the network, virtual network interfaces, provides a metadata service akin to the sort of cloud in style of a metadata service that we're evolving based on what applications, what clients running in inside the containers or VM, a virtual TPM. And then we have a piece that actually interacts with the actual runtime, whether that runtime is a hypervisor, whether it's Containerd, whether it's K3S. So there's work on K3S Longhorn that sort of um, is being added um, primarily for enabling what we call edge node clustering. So there are clusters of three nodes autonomously running out at each site, um, three or more. Um, so that's sort of the picture of all of these, these things. Um, we're setting things up as Four partitions plus whatever ARM needs because it stores a bunch of firmware on the SSD as well. Um, so um, the thing that's common with others is that yeah, we have dual image partitions, whatever um, root partitions. Um, we have a config separate config partition which has the personality. If you don't have a TPM, this thing actually has the device private key that identifies the device as well. Yeah, if you have a TPM, the private key is actually stored in the in the TPM. It's generated in the TPM, never leaves the TPM type thing. Um, and then we have what we call the persist partition, which is used for the sort of persistent volumes, the images that get downloaded by and, and stored in container D, logs that are waiting to be sent up to the controller, um, configuration checkpoints, etc. Um, the things that have sort of user data in there, persist vault, this is actually encrypted. We can run with different file systems. So it's either X4 with FScript or CFS with native encryption. Um, the config and, and image 
partitions are integrity protected using the TPM measured boot um, capability. And so there's sort of multiple options and this is actually evolving. Uh, and, you know, we started with, with X4, um, persist running using only devices using only one disk, right? And then as people wanted to add more disk, we said, okay, the easiest way of doing that is putting CFS into the picture. Um, and you can choose whether you want, you know, whether you want striping and mirroring or, or RAID C configurations. And then the Longhorn work that's underway where yeah, we're giving some set of partitions and or drives to Longhorn across, across the cluster to manage. Um, Eve API. So the, um, the fundamental premise is, yeah, you can actually connect to these devices because of firewalls and et cetera, right? So, and the thing that's the most robust is just having it dial home to the controller over HTTPS and, you know, telling the site needs to allow this outbound HTTPS, which is typically not a big deal. In some cases they ask you, well, which IP addresses does it connect to or which URLs or whatever. So um, people, People in some deployments, they're quite conservative in terms of even what outbound connectivity they allow. Um, the API is based on declarative configuration. Um, so thou shalt have this network configuration, thou shalt run this uh, version of, of US, et cetera. Um, and then there's a few operations like the ability to reboot e either the device, restart the application, restart the application with the original content of its um, of its persistent volume, sort of reverting back to the original content of that. So things that operationally are useful for dealing with issues out in the field. Um, the API also has a notion of self-compressing status. So, so one thing, I didn't go into the details about flaky network. So flaky network might mean that, okay, the latency is a bit off and it drops a few packets. It might mean it goes out for a minute. It might mean that intensely when they're out on the road, they don't want to pay for the satellite connectivity, so it's disconnected for a week. Right? So you don't necessarily want to have things queue up here um, and store a bunch of things that are not necessarily very re relevant when you reconnect. Um, so that's why we have this notion of self-compressing self that is that the progression that happens when when a workload gets deployed, it goes through several states. Well, you only care about the most recent states. You can actually throw away the, the previous ones. Um, likewise, with, with the metrics, we define metrics in terms of CPU and network usage based on actual counters so that if you want to know the rate, you can do the, the difference. You can calculate the slope of that curve, even if you're missing intermediate data points. Um, the API is protobuf encoded, um, uses mutual TLS, um, plus end-to-end -end object signing. And object signing is to deal with these man-in-the-middle content inspecting proxies. Um, basically, they're doing TLS man-in-the-middle for which enterprises deploy in some, some environments. It's very common in, in labs and whatever. It's less common out in production. Um, so the object signing is there so that, that you don't even need to trust the, the network admin, which might be a completely different organization than the people who built the service, the functionality get deployed. You don't need to trust them. They can see the data, they can actually modify it. And then there's a level of user secrets where we felt that it's important to have even stronger protection so there's actually end-to-end -end object encryption of those. So this is stuff like whatever credentials you put in your cloud init file for a VM or in some environment variable for, for, for a, a container, um, data store passwords to go and access content, et cetera. Um, so that has one more layer. So as you can say, there was a lot of focus on security. Uh, so we did this stuff, but the operational sort of Ease of the stuff is actually the key thing as well. So, um, Eric, I, I was so, uh, that that yeah. first one with the um, dial home to controller is that so? I saw the atom controller on the other slide. Is that um, do you set a policy or a configuration for your edge nodes and and the edge nodes pull that information from the controller or did you just give a little more detail on that? 
So, so as part of onboarding a device, um, where the goal is to set it up so that you actually have mutual um, trust, right? Um, and so, the the way we do, so so the trust Eve trusting the controller is expressed as trusting a root certificate, and then it just needs to have you know a URL to go access, right? and then the onboarding process is actually getting this device running EVOS to actually register one way or another. There are several ways. Register its device certificate with a controller. So now they both know each other from a security perspective, right? And that that uh, they can do this. And Eve actually has you know, the URL for, to go talk to the controller. And then it keeps on pulling that thing, um, uh, pull, pulling the controller. We actually did a demo this week uh, of integrating the stuff with with um, fighter device on onboarding, so it's actually a sister project in LF Edge that's been doing this stuff. Um, so that gives you a bit another sort of level of flexibility in terms of this, uh, this sort of like what 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 is actually installed by the hardware manufacturer. What what, what do they customize things to what level? Um, is there some other sort of staging thing? But the idea is making it as easy as possible to drop ship hardware with EWAS pre-installed, and then it comes out there, and it either is already onboarded to a controller or it does that sort of when it boots out in the field. So, does that answer the question? Or? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, sort of building onto the 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 challenging things here. Um, so I think that this stuff, has, is there in other projects? The thing that we actually tried to get was good watchdog coverage with automatic rollback. So devices, which many of these sort of ruggedized servers do, they have some hardware watchdog support um, with the Linux software watchdog running on top of that stuff. And then being able to do this so that it actually does automatic rollback. Um, and this includes, maybe that's on another slide as well, but it includes the case that, well, what does it mean for a device to be functional? Well, it needs to sort of be able to boot and stay up running the new version of EOS, but it also needs to be able to talk to the controller. So if you have a bad interaction between your, say your ethernet chip version and the actual ethernet device driver that came potentially in a new version of the kernel, well, if it can't talk to the controller, it's no longer remotely manageable, so it rolls back, even if it can otherwise function fine. Um, and the other thing that, that uh, I'm making sure I don't repeat things too much, uh, the, the, the API is there, and what is actually in the API is being able to Define the network connectivity. So not only should this thing talk over which Ethernet interfaces, is it over Wi-Fi? What's the Wi-Fi password? If so, does it does it talk over LTE? Which modems? Which um, uh, what's the APN? Right? Is it used? Oh, in some cases there's static IPs or HTTPS proxies that need to be either configured or configured with a certificate. So there's a number of network things here that 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 might be required. Like out in a factory, static IP seems to be the norm. Right? Um, so those things are there. And these are declarative. And they have the same sort of AB fallback uh, so that people can just roll out and state, here's the desired configuration. If it doesn't work, it will actually roll back to the previous one and report. It means you can actually roll out a future version. It will try to use it. It fails. It will try it again later periodically. So you can actually change your proxy configuration, um, hopefully without shooting yourself in the foot. Right? This is one of the, the hardest parts of in running these networks. So. But then the sort of things that, that build security on top of that, some of them are sort of easy, right? Disable all of the ports that are not used, like USB, et cetera, serial ports but they can be given to applications for if applications need to use those or workloads. Um, there are no user accounts or logins in EWAS itself. Applications might have those things, right? And they need to manage that. Uh, this, yeah, I touched on this here, the sort of zero touch, zero trust onboarding, right? Um, with different different flavors. Um, and then EWAS actually includes a basic layer four stateful firewall 
that's controlled through policy as well. So you can say, hey, this application, this container should only be able to talk to this MQTT port in AWS or whatever. Um, um, so you can control both outbound as well as connectivity between different containers and pods using that, that firewall as well as VMs, of course. Um, and, and people sometimes deploy virtual security appliances. These are what we've seen in the field is typically in the form of virtual machines. So the the firewall vendors, you know, provide VM images for virtual ones that some people feel is is necessary. And they could do other things as well, combining that with SD WAN overlays and whatever to better manage their satellite connectivity or whatever it might be. Right? But but the ability to, of deploying those things and they help with the, the network functionality is actually quite useful. But that was the easy part. So how do we actually end up dealing with handling a stolen disk or a stolen server? And it turned out that, that I haven't seen people do this stuff, partly because I don't think people have focused on this on, on unattended um, devices with these constraints about worrying about CVs and, and sort of downgrade attacks on the software and firmware. But there's a bunch of standard things that we use, which is, you know, TPM chips, Gives your hardware root of trust. You can generate and store keys and certificates there. Um, the TPM chips or the, the trusted computing group specified how to do measured boot and remote at the station. In some cases, people use the vague term secure boot, which actually means two different things. One is this measured boot, um, and the other one is, is I think it's called secure boot, um, but people bundled up together. But it's basically when you have a set of certificates that say, as long as this firmware is signed by Microsoft, it's fine to boot, right? Uh, or it's signed by somebody else who has the ability to insert their their trusted certificates into the BIOS. Um, so uh, those are actually related, but they, they have quite different properties. Um, the other piece that's there is there's a notion of sealing the keys. I think this came up in for one of the other edge uh, special purpose operating systems. You can actually seal the keys under in the TPM under the TPM measurement. So, which means that as long as or only if the hardware firmware boot chain hasn't changed, can you retrieve that key from the TPM. Otherwise, you can't get it. It's gone. Right. Um, so, so we took those pieces and then we said, how do we deal with things when 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 these things are disconnected? And the approach we came up with was saying, okay, with this key sealing thing, we can avoid a testing if there is no change. So if the power goes out, comes back on, it's funny. Nobody plugged in a USB stick or you know changed some BIOS setting in the middle that it made the BIOS sort of measure differently, right? Then it will just come up and keep on running what it was running before. Um, and then the other thing we did was, okay, if that's not the case, well, how, where, where do we have the key? So there's the, 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 the principle is that, yeah, we trust the controller to some extent. So it actually gets to store safe keep a version, a key that's wrapped such that only this TPM chip can, can use it, right? It can only decrypt it and use it. So it can actually keep it there as a, as a backup copy. And now the device has to prove, the, the Edge OS has to prove that, hey, I have these measurements, I'm fine, give me back my encrypted key. And it's up to whatever policies you have in the controller to say, okay, is this a no because it shouldn't change, right? Or do I know that, oh, I sent that a technician to update the BIOS yesterday, so it's okay that the BIOS measures differently, right? Um, you can have diff different policies um, over there. So this is, we can only do this because we're assuming that with these devices, they're always tethered to, they have a security relationship with a controller. Right? You, you can't sort of add this stuff afterwards because you have no, you have you have no place that you can necessarily trust or have this level of mutual trust. So, yeah. so that's sort of the 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 thing that is described in detail in that in that paper that we did a couple of years ago. Um, um, so sort of summarizing things, right? Uh, 
and and it, so there's there's some overlap. Some of the things that that I didn't see as I went through the other proposals, or to not maybe not to the same extent or with the same philosophy, is this, you know, how do we mute, do mutually authenticated secure onboarding, and and we sort of are exploring how do we integrate that with FDO. I think that one can also use sort of FDO out of the box as well, but you need to figure out yeah what what what's the sort of security. What pieces do you trust for what in this picture? Uh, this notion of having network configs and fallback between them, right? I think that that's something that to us has been quite helpful um, because people can actually change things and they, they can do various things. They might deploy things in the staging environment running DHCP, but then out in the field, it's going to have a static IP, but they want to set all of that stuff up when it's sitting in the staging environment. And as long as they get the static IP correct, so it works when it deploys out at the site, it, it just works, right? But this is static configuration. You better make sure you're typing it correctly type thing. Um, we have a notion of bootstrapping things. Um, so if you have like proxies and and static IP, and you don't know what those are going to be. We have a notion of signing this a protobuf message with that, signed by the controller, which is trusted, and uh, you can put on the USB stick, for instance, as a way of delivering it to the device when it boots. It says, hey, I have some additional network configuration here I should apply, so it can then actually manage to connect to the controller and be remotely manage manageable from there. Um, I mentioned this, yeah, it's A B boot, but but the watchdog system that automatically rolls back if so if the power goes out, if it can talk to the controller, whatever, during the first few minutes of running um the new version, it says yeah, I might have a problem, so I'm just gonna roll back at someone. I will again be remotely manageable so people can figure out what went wrong and if it was just a power glitch, they can try again, right? Um the, immut the OS is immutable the way it's built, right? Uh, squash FS plus integrity checks using the TPM for a measured boot file system encryption I mentioned. The other thing I didn't touch is this thing that has proven to be useful out at this distributed edge is, yeah, there's, there's places, countries, they might not have access to Docker Hub or somewhere. Uh, so they want to be able to set up their own OCI registries, sort of in country or in their enterprise network. Um, a place to put that level of indirection so that as you go on and deploy your configuration on what you're supposed to be running, you know, how can you change the sort of top level part of the name, where to go fetch it? Um, and there might be better ways of doing this stuff with, uh, with for containers in terms of being able to replace the top level part of the the, the, the the name of the container but or the URL, whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if I should go into the uh, last ones, but I mean, the, 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 this whole sort of philosophy around having signed configuration and eventual consistency and, and means that, that you can do things I'm actually talking about the last bullet, but uh, you can do things where where you don't care how this configuration is delivered. It's delivered. Is it delivered in a second over over the internet with TLS, or is it delivered on a USB stick or through a QR code or whatever? Right. So you can actually do things where you can carry in configuration that's been audited, and if it takes a week for the configuration to arrive from the controller, well, it still arrives, right? Uh, if the auditing process is is slow. Um, it's not a problem. Um, so that enables various um, different ways of, uh, of running things where you still want to have centralized policy control of the set of approved um, container versions, whatever, to run, right? The set of security policies you can run, that's all centrally managed, signed by the controller or by the user of the controller. But you, but you can then still push that stuff out to very different environments. This local operator, um, I mentioned the utility of being able to reboot things, um, right, restart things when things go wrong. It turns out that that's useful when you have non-IT staff on site that just wants to get back to work after something goes wrong. But 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 it's not 
we can't think of it as the declarative configuration because it's not actually stating what this thing is supposed to be running. It just says go retry effectively, right? Retry by restarting this thing. Um, so we actually ended up putting a, an API there that um, enables people to configure some local server running on site in the enterprise, on the truck, whatever, where this local operator can say, hey, please try, try re restarting this thing. Um, or, or please run a different subset of applications for the time being because I don't have enough resources to run all of them because something failed. Um, so, so there's sort of this distinction between the declarative uh, state and then, okay, here's my sort of operational overlay on that that, that doesn't change that state. Um, we wanted to avoid what we've seen in industry before when people have had local APIs as well as remote APIs where you get sort of multiple masters that are trying to tell you what to do, right? And and how do you re reconcile what should I actually do? Because because the original you know, network management system tells me to be configured this way. Some local operator comes in through the CLI and changes things. So what should I do tomorrow? What should I do? Um, by, by being very, we wanted to avoid that by being very explicit about what is actually the declarative configuration? What are things that an operator wants to do that overlay on top of that? And I think that was, oh, yeah, that's right. So um, we've, we've been sort of tinkering with things in terms of the virtualization. Um, you know, USB is something that's there. We've done something which is about application volume snapshot and rollback. And as people started asking for this, I said, well, wait, they want, want a, a backup system, right? You know, disk backup. It's like, no, what they care about, the, the sort of biggest concern is they roll out a new version of the application. And maybe it doesn't work the way it's supposed to out in this particular location because of other things. So being able to say, I, I can take a snapshot of the configuration before the application basically be able to revert back to the old version of the application of the container. But then I also have to be concerned about the persistent volumes and they could have been corrupted because the application was broken. So please keep a snapshot of the persistent volume from when you ran the old version and roll back to that one as you roll back the application configuration. So that's something that it's, it's a bit special, right? Uh, but it has to do with the sort of pain of dealing with things that break remotely. And in theory, this shouldn't happen, just like you know the Ethernet device driver not working with the hardware. Right? In practice, when you have thousands or tens of thousands of them, it will happen somewhere because of some, some glitches. So. Um, so there's various things around connectivity on the way, handling broken TPM chips and firmware. Um, so that clustered compute and storage, right? This is um, getting K3S up and running. Um, a real-time support uh, using the Linux real-time pa patches. We're looking at CATA containers and confidential containers. And the other thing, oh, I didn't put it explicitly here. To go back to this picture, right? Uh, the sort of realization that you know, we have this last half here, which is about device, right? Well, we sort of realized that, well, these things can actually be more separate, right? The fact that we need to have something that, that does more of the, the the device OS and runtime orchestration and then having different runtimes, right? There's already a number of them here. I think there's actually gonna be more of a time, right? And then how do you actually separate the stuff so that this stuff is more pluggable? Um, more configurable so that you can say, okay, this version of EWAS, but I want to run it with K3S plus Longhorn, or I just want to run it with the smallest possible container runtime I can think about without Kubernetes because I'm, I'm resource constrained. Um, so that's sort of like if, how the higher level architecture, I think needs to evolve to be able to get that level of flexibility. So those were the slides I put together. Uh, so questions or comments? Uh, clear as mud. Pretty awesome. Like very impressive. 
So we've been at this for six years or so, but yes. So. <laughs> I see that it, you bought a lot of ideas from like a lot of tools uh, and kind of created a tool set that is tailored um, to this specific use case. And I, I actually started my professional career working for an embedded systems company. So I, I know it's a million times harder uh, to, 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 to get this right um, for unattended devices than it is for servers. So that is, that is super impressive. Yeah, and I mean, we started a while ago, which is why we actually started with Sun, right? And we said, oh, no, KVM is easier with dealing with GPUs. And then, okay, we're going to run containers, and now we're going to run Kubernetes. So you know, that at some level didn't exist, right? Or no one thought of that for the edge when we started. So that's why it you sort of need to refresh refresh things, but also figuring out what can you what can you throw away or what can you refactor as you actually go forward, right? Because none of this stuff is standing still, so... Um, So I think um, that was sort of, uh, I, I tried to, um, as I mentioned on Slack, right, I, I looked at, I listened to the previous recordings and sort of figured out, yeah, what is actually common? And there's clearly for these things at the edge, the sort of notions about immutable images and having A-B booting type things, those P pieces are common, right? And then, you know, how are people thinking about the other aspects? Um, and, and sort of saying, yeah, what's the taxonomy? Is there useful ways to actually describing these things to to compare and contrast, right? So, uh, so that was sort of in the in the back of my mind as I was trying to stress what what's the salient things here. So. So, other questions or comments? Oh, thanks a lot, Eric. This was really good. Let me go see where do I stop share again? Or did I stop share? Operating Zoom is too hard. No, no, you're sharing. Yes, I thought so. Where did it go? Yeah, I love it when it hides itself. <laughs> Well, I have a window, but I can't control anything on that window. Bizarre. Huh? Okay. Never, I haven't seen this behavior before. Oh, there we go. Now I can get to the big screen. Okay. Oops. But it still wants to share. That's very strange. Okay. I have this button. I have uh, another I button I can use. No, I I found another button since I was joined twice. So. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, next on the agenda, Danielle, did you want to talk about uh, Open Source Summit? Um. Did I put it in the agenda? Or whoever put that there. <laughs> so we had it. We actually had it as a as a to do item in the in the list of to do items uh, on top of all of the agenda. So I just pasted it down because we just wrapped this up on on Tuesday. So yeah, Danielle actually reminded me that there was the Open Source Summit CFP going on uh, in uh, on tu on Tuesday uh, when we were in the office, and I was like, oh no. There's the deadline, but they pushed the deadline for, for two days, uh, changed it from April 30th to May 1st, so we could still wrap it up. And we just did it on site um, and then, yeah, submitted it. So I, I uh, didn't need to submit for her. She did that herself. Uh, we put um, folks that spoke up in the, in the Slack chat uh, in the uh, BOF, and uh, we also... Uh, edit Eric and um, I keep forgetting the yeah. um, the name from um, from Susan. Robert? I think, yeah. No, it's a, I have it in front of me. So Richard Brown from Susan. Richard. Right? Oh, Richard, Richard, right? Rich, yeah. Yeah, it's like R Brown. So I was like, yeah. autocompleting, oh. but wrong. <laughs> 
Uh, we had him. We had him in the at the first um, uh, BOF, and uh, he was he was pretty great. So great contributions. We actually by by accident we had a we had a Eve uh, contributor at the first um, BOF as well. They just they just popped up in the in the BOF, and then we started chatting. That was the first time I learned uh, about Eve. So oh, okay. great stuff. So yeah, yeah. That, that submitted. Uh, please keep your fingers crossed. But um, yeah, it should be nice. Uh, they give BOF sessions 45 minutes to 60 minutes. So we have a bit more time for chatting. Cool. Good. That was it. Then I snuck in another item in the pending items list. And that is the, um, the white paper that uh, Sean started. Not sure if you want to discuss this. Yeah, it looks like we have a little time. Uh, so at least a call out for that. Um, I tried to just start getting an outline together just to have a little structure of what we might, might want to cover in a white paper. Um, so this is really just, just brainstorm trying to get ideas out. So um, if anyone is interested in working on this, please feel free to add other topics not covered in the current uh, outline that I have there. If there's something in that outline that you don't think is really a good fit for like an intro to this concept, uh, then you, we can definitely cut it out. Really, this was just me trying to get some random thoughts down on paper so that we could start thinking about what we would want to say about each thing. And then um, I'm hoping if we, if a few folks could take a look at this and and if this, um, you know, if it seems like we have a reasonable outline to start with, then we could maybe um maybe divide up some things here and have different people kind of flesh out some areas and start to get some actual content together um you know there's no deadline on this right now um there, there's nothing that you know we've, we've said we would deliver but I, I think having something out out there you know some output from this working group in a form of a white paper it could give a, a nice reference thing for uh, people that are starting to look at the idea of a special purpose OS and, and just trying to understand what are they, what does it apply for, for what I'm trying to do? Um, you know, if I'm going to do this, what are my options? Those types of things. So, um, yeah, not, not, not a ton to say about it right now, but, but if anyone is interested, the link is in there. Um, the link is in the Slack channel. Uh, if you scroll back a bit, uh, be great have some folks look at it. I, I got pulled off on some other things, but I'm hoping to get back to that and, and start um, uh, seeing if I can just start collecting some more content and ideas and things like that. So anyone else wants to join in, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll definitely have a look at it in the next weeks. Um, and uh, I was I was basically trying to grasp uh, the direction that you want to take it um, from the doc. Uh, and now with the with the explanation you gave, it's kind of um, it feels like a wrap up of all of the intros that we had, and that's that's really nice. Yeah, it would be great to have um, and great to put on the uh, on the working group web website. It makes a lot of sense. So as time allows, um, I'll have a look in that regard. Great, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna go t take a look at it as well um, in a bit more detail. And yeah, um, be great to have I think, too. yeah, and and I think part of it is sort of figuring out, yeah, is there is there some distinction between the the edge ones as opposed to the cloud ones, or or is it just what you're assuming about the underlying hardware, or virtual hardware, right? It's sort of like how far how far down they go. Um, yeah. I'm gonna be on vacation next week, so it, it, I'm gonna take a while before I get to it. But... Yeah, yeah. Like I said, there's no hard deadline coming up, so uh, we have a little time. It would be great to get something out soon, obviously, but um, you know, this isn't something that uh, I think. Well, it's not something that I cannot prior prioritize over some of my other things. So um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but and yeah, the the timing too. I th thought this would be a good follow on after we kind of wrapped all of the presentations that we were doing for the different OSs and. You know, I, I think I, I kind of want to go back and review, but there were certainly some similarities, a lot of things like the, the AV partition upgrades and stuff, things like that, where um, I think if you look back over them, there's some commonality um, or at least some common patterns that a lot of us are following. Um, and then there's some really unique things, too. So it, it'd be great to um, 
uh, somehow present that in a, in a good way to so that someone brand new can kind of understand what they're looking for, what they need. Yeah, and someone who understands the details with with the different container optimized ones as well, right? Sort of like yeah, where are they where they the same, where have they taken different approaches that would be useful as well, right? So. Um, because there's clearly, I think there's more of a desire to be able to customize things, but then, then how are people gonna gone about doing this, right? And I didn't quite follow all that or sort of try to extract yeah, what what is the same and what's different. So. Okay, um, we're almost at an hour now. Um, any any final topics or anything anyone wants to bring up? All right. Well, if anything, if you do think of anything, um, you know, I, I don't think we have anything on the agenda yet for the next meeting. So uh, anyone with any ideas, uh, topics, please feel free to add that to the agenda doc. Um, otherwise, uh, I think last time, last meeting, we didn't really have anything and it ended up being just a nice discussion. Um, you know, so that could happen or it could be just a short meeting. Uh, so. I mean, I'd suggest putting the white paper on there and say, okay, here we, we have something to aim for in two weeks. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and sort of like, really talk about what's the state of things and, and you can go over it. If if nothing has changed, but hopefully some people, sure. including myself, will get some time before now and then. But yeah. Yeah, good, yeah. good point. Good point. <laughs> I'll do that. All right. Uh, I guess that's it then. Thanks.